For a few days, I've been speaking with uh, Diana about India and her connection to India. Um, and uh, it's, it seems like there's a, a really strong sort of uh, bond between Lithuania and India, which I didn't know about and have had the chance to learn more about. Um, and I think uh, one of the things you said to me while we were speaking, um, especially about the, the linguistic connections, you said that it's a, a very, it's mysterious and um, a, a serious connection that, you know, uh, should be investigated more also. Uh, I thought that was a, a beautiful way of putting it. Um, so but could you maybe first tell us um, what sparked your interest in India initially? Uh, very good evening to everyone. I, I hope I can balance my voice so it doesn't echo too much and you hear it. Good evening everyone and thank you Anushka for uh, speaking to me uh, tonight. Uh, yes, we are basically talking about the whole net of connections. Me and in India, Lithuania and India, Lithuanian language and Sanskrit, which is a mysterious linguistic connection that we share. But if... Um, if I can start, or rather remember how it has started for me, it has started very long ago. Uh, my interest in India was, in fact, sparked in a very banal way. It was Indian movies. Uh, when I was a child, I was so fascinated by Indian movies that, uh, and in fact, it was this year that through a lucky coincidence, I met, I went to a, a book discussion of Muzaffar Ali, and while sitting there and talking to the uh, film director himself and others, I realized that it must have been Umrao Jan. I must have been around 12, and I got so fascinated by the movie that I came back and I drew Umrao on the piece of paper. And I don't draw. I don't know how to draw or paint. I have nothing to, to do with this there, but I, as a child, was so impressed by something very different because culturally I had no background, no information about what is India or what is this Laknavi, you know, special, because Umrao Jan is not any Indian movie. It's also very culturally specific. But it just struck me so that I didn't know how to express my fascination, so I used it, you know, with a pencil and, 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 and a piece of paper. I, I visualized something. Uh, but then, you know, soon enough, I came across very cruel, film critic, was a Lithuanian mm -hmm. film critic who told, not just me, not me personally, but he wrote an article saying that, you know, Indian movies have nothing to do with real India. That was like condemnation of Indian movies. <laughs> so then I really took interest in uh, reading whatever I could find in libraries, books, media of that time, which was Soviet. I was born and grew up in still Soviet Union times was well, very controlled, and, but India was a friendly country, so we had some information. Just to answer the question, so what was this real India that was not reflected in movies so much? And then it, of course, started. I studied Indian philosophy, I studied international relations, and my subject was India. Then I joined foreign service, then I also started teaching Indian history at the university, then trips to India came one after another, long trips, stays, and so it's a, it's, I mean, no looking back. In fact, I ended up being ambassador of Lithuania and India, of which I'm very happy about. Uh, and this relationship is only acquiring many new dimensions because every day I'm learning something invaluable that puts one more piece of puzzle into that very big picture. That is India. Mm -hmm. oh. And yes, there was a book. So probably the important thing is that a book about India happened to me. Uh, it's because of this probably that I'm at literature festival. I don't really consider myself a writer, but yes, I have written this book on India, a very big one, very heavy one, where I, um, but that's an old story. That's 2011, where I put in whatever I wanted to put across to the Lithuanian leader, li readers, it's in Lithuanian language. I try to be balanced between the popular and academic knowledge on India so that people could understand but also could visualize, could imagine in a more tangible way what a colorful and what a complicated uh, thing is India. 
Yeah, so um, I think the title of the book translates to all of my Indias, right? It's, uh, yes, I actually use that very old, uh, you know, figure, literary figure, which is not my invention. You know, it was probably, maybe it's colonial, maybe I shouldn't have done it, but the plurality of Indias was so obvious to me that I decided to express it in all of my Indias because every encounter with India for me had been different and uh, you need to really put them together to speak about India. Uh, no, I, I was thinking of how you said you, you were searching for the real India after you, know, you encountered it in film, but uh, all of you, my India sort of represents that uh, all of those possibilities, I think, were true. Um, but so, uh, to just so tell you all a little more about the book, um, I, this is, I think, one of the only copies that um, uh, Diana had right now, and um, I had the chance to borrow it from her and sort of um, use uh, Google Translate to try and read a few excerpts since it's written in Lithuanian. And uh, what I found was that there was just um, this beautiful, seamless integration of excerpts from um, your uh, travel diaries from the 90s uh, and then sort of uh, more academic writing. But I actually felt that it was more essayistic. It was going into like the, the cultural intricacies. Um, and then I believe you, you wrote it with a different intention back then, but it has become a bit of a travel guide for Lithuanians coming to India. Yes, I never, I mean, I kept a diary as a student. I spent one very rich year in India. I traveled a lot uh, all over. I experienced a lot. I, you know, I had families who had invited me to their, you know, family holidays, pilgrimages. That's how I had been to Rameshwaram with one Tamil family who have became, become my adopted parents, so to say, because they were doing this ancestors you know, circle of trips. Uh, but I was, I think, clever enough at that time to understand how unique my experiences were and how easy it is to forget it. So I used to write down things. It was not a diary for my soul, not, you know, about my feelings, but rather a documented, uh, you know, sequence of events and experiences I would have. And I just kept it for myself. I never thought it would be useful or never had any plan for, for, for a book. But uh, 10 years later, in, it happened 10 years later when I was uh, expecting my second child and I was on maternity where you have more time. I'm, I'm a bureaucrat, I'm a diplomat, so we work, you know, we have office hours. Uh, so when I was a little more flexible, I started thinking about doing something with it because there was a whole stream of very superficial writing. People started traveling and everybody who would come to India for three weeks will start writing a book. You know, very, I saw this, that, and it didn't make much sense to me because it was, you know, the, this blogger, blogger time came where you are very irresponsibly just, you know, floating whatever you have just experienced. I said that a more reflective uh, impressions a uh, series of impressions and perhaps the academic explanation giving a background would make much more sense to the reader because you know if I'm going to a wedding it's very easy to describe it's so colorful you know and, and everything is so uh, impresses upon you but then I said okay I'll give a chapter on what the wedding is for an Indian family what it involves uh, you know, I would meet some very interesting woman on the street. Then I would give a chapter on, you know, a womanhood, you know, between the Devi and, uh, and uh, you know, someone lower than the man, you know, um, whatever. I go to a South Indian temple somewhere in Tanjavur, so I would give a chapter on temple, its architecture, its meaning in the community and so on. So it became a very thick book. Ultimately, it's like a brick. You can easily hurt someone. <laughs> Uh, but since it's involved so much of geography, people started using it as a guidebook. So when I was posted as a diplomat to India for the first time in 2011, uh, you know, there would be people coming with this heavy book, knocking at the door of the embassy, saying, can you please sign it? <laughs> you know? So this is certainly not something I had expected. Uh, unwillingly, it became a reference uh, to uh, many Lithuanians, hundreds, if not thousands probably, 
because the book would be borrowed, you know, now it's out of print. Two editions have uh, come out, they had been out of print already. I can still see that some people are trying to buy it secondhand. Uh, but so it, it had served several purposes, including the encouragement of tourism to India, I could say, probably. <laughs> Uh, and so there was this one line from the uh, cover of your book, which I had sort of translated, which I loved. Uh, you said, India is hard not to idealize or demonize. I just tried to understand her. And I think that is sort of what I've sensed about your approach. And it, um, it felt like that's just a lovely approach to have to any new place or new person. Um, and so, but there is also this other um, connection you've written about um, the, the traveler um, Antonas Poshka from the 1930s. He uh, made, I think, like um, a motorbike journey from Lithuania to India, uh, which took him eight years. And uh, then he spent quite some time here. Um, so uh, could you talk about your... Uh, yes, things? certainly. Uh, this traveler, Antonas Poshka, became my inspiration. He came for a very specific um, uh, objective to dig into that linguistic connection that at that time it was already known that for some reasons our mother tongue, Lithuanian, shares very close uh, grammatical uh, connection to Sanskrit. So he had this whole, and he was poor. He was a poor student, his, his parents were farmers, he had no money. So the bike journey was because he couldn't afford anything else. Even the bike did, he didn't have, but a Belgium motorbike company gave him the bike in return for advertising the brand all, all through, you know, all through his journey. There were two of them, in fact. Uh, they separated in Iran. The bike was also sold in Iran and he arrived on a ship. But the one year that he spent on the road from Lithuania to Iran is, is quite a journey. And uh, one thing I also want to specifically mention that Poshka was, and this was a time of uh, Esperanto language, where people in all parts of the world were suddenly learning a very, you know, a language that would connect them. So artificial language, which would connect and make all other languages equal, uh, because it's made up of, of, of different languages. So Poshka was very active promoter of Esperanto, and he would rely on the clubs of Esperanto language, you know, all, in all countries where he went. He, they would lodge him, they would feed him on the way, including in India. So while his objective was linguistic connection between his Lithuanian language and Sanskrit, but his tool, apart from the motorbike, was Esperanto, because he mostly survived and uh, sustained himself through Esperanto. So I'm very happy to see uh, Giri, the professor of Esperanto from Bangalore, whom I finally met today because we have been corresponding on this connection and he knows about Poshka and Esperanto from, from our old uh, correspondence. But Esperanto had played a role probably even more than English plays now because some people were able to, you know, bridge cultures, continents, languages and, and communicate. And I realized through his story that, you know, <clears throat> We were much more connected and we were aware. 100 years ago, people used to write so many letters to each other, our leaders, our intellectuals, that you know, we, we can't even understand how connected they were despite all the you know, shortages in, in, in communication technology. Um, so I feel like you've um, also explored India through um, a, a variety of uh, sort of facets. Like I know you speak fluent Hindi and uh, <laughs> you've been uh, studying Hindi poetry and uh, Bharatnatyam and also now you're getting to know the trees of India. So um, I don't know where, where to begin, so, uh, but uh, maybe uh, you could talk about your, your journey getting to know India through dance, through Bharat Natyam. Uh, well, uh, uh, classical dances of India have fascinated me since childhood. I don't know if it's Sumrawajan, which, I mean, technically she dances Kathak there with some embellishments maybe, or something else, but I've always been fascinated. And on my first posting in Strasbourg, I met this Tamil lady from Pondicherry who was giving Bharatanatyam classes. So I enrolled and I did it for two years with such utmost pleasure that I can't describe. But 
the moment came when she wanted to, me to go on stage and then I said, no, I'm not a, I just can't perform. I can't. I mean, I enjoyed it as a sort of a yoga, as a sort of a, you know, the practice that's involved a lot of discipline. Uh, and a lot of learning because for a foreigner to, I mean, it's not just technique, the body technique, but you need to have the whole philosophy, the whole, you know, dictionary of gestures that mean things beyond the immediate, you know, uh, whatever uh, configuration of fingers or elbows. So it was a great learning journey and uh, until now, Maratanachim remains my favorite among others because I know a little bit more, I had practiced a little more. So it is a fascinating journey and it's just one very serious aspect of India, the dance, the aesthetics of dance and music, because we also had to learn a little bit of singing, classical singing, so I, I did it with my teacher, you know. So it's a very, of course, very clumsy way and I would not be able to uh, replicate it after many years, but I think it gave me a lot to uh, enter the, the, the very rich world of, 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 of you know, Indian culture. Yeah. from inside maybe <laughs> yeah and it's a very embodied knowledge um, compared to maybe the the linguistic sort of forms of knowledge and since i studied history i was also very fond of history and uh, history in india is lots of monuments lots of heritage that you can touch you know uh, not so not not so many places in europe you have where you can touch things with your hands that are thousands of years old and in india you can you know the Ashoka pillar in Delhi, now I think they have fenced it off, but when I came for the first time, you were able to hug it, you know, something that is over 2,000 years old, you know, so it would always give me, and I said, probably there is not a stone in Delhi that I have not touched or climbed upon. <laughs> so yeah. the other aspect, when you told me it's trees, because now I am in, 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 uh, discovering the trees of Delhi, you know, live in Delhi, and I have told myself that like I have known all the monuments and the history, I have no clue what grows next to those monuments. So now I'm into trees <laughs> and the flora. So, I mean, there's no limit to that. And since I wanted always to have a wholesome idea of India, I think that's how you get it. You can't be only in one area. It's so much of everything. And the trees, if you start learning, you know, we have a small tree walkers group with a guide who is an Indian lady. You know, every tree comes with so much of stories. It's in culture. It's something uh, like a, a fragrant uh, Molsari tree, which Tagore was apparently writing poems about, but I couldn't stand its fragrance. It was too strong and gave me headache, you know. And then some other tree where you can cook something or some other tree that, you know, trees, leaves are offered to Shiva or, or to some other deity. So it's not just trees. It always is something much beyond, <laughs> beyond mm -hmm. that one you know, uh, botanical aspect of it. And you've also organized some history walks uh, around Delhi because of, there's a, the, a link that you've drawn between uh, Vilnius, which is the capital of Lithuania, and um, specifically to Glakabad, uh, being medieval city. Yeah, as diplomats, you know, we have to build those bridges. And if there are no bridges, we invent them also. So this year, and it's not my first history walk I did in India on Indian soil. I've led people around, but this one was a specific walk because we are celebrating 700 years of our capital city, Vilnius. And uh, in Delhi, there is one historical city, which is in ruins, which is exactly from the same years. It's exactly like a, a contemporary of Vilnius. So what we did was a historical walk in those ruins, but we talked about both places. So what you see here, you discuss, and then you try to, you ask the audience to imagine what is there, 5,000 kilometers away. 5,000 kilometers is not really such a great thing. So in history, we have had those linkages, and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania was, you know, the 50, 15th century, we were the biggest in Europe. So we were neighbors with uh, much of Asia, in fact, because our borders were stretching to the Black Sea. So it was fun, everybody enjoyed it because they learned about the two things. And I think these walks, which are partly physically tangible, partly imaginary, are becoming a fashion now. Now many people do it. You know, with augmented reality, whatever, uh, you know, online, you can do so many things. So, so that's what we try to do in Delhi. And probably we'll repeat it again. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, a beautiful way of like uh, traversing distances. And believe me, medieval cities had so much in common. Every city had to protect itself. Every city had to get water. 
every city had to have an area where people lived, where people stored their, you know, goods and, and food, uh, where they entertained, uh, you know, it's not that difficult, in fact, to find parallels. And every city has a legend of origin. And it's so beautiful to go into the legends of origin. You can write books about, you know, legends of origin. And in fact, Vilnius and Tuglagabad, the city of that historical city of Delhi, do have uh, similar origin legends. So, you know, dig in and find out. <laughs> um, so we've, I mean, okay, we have uh, five, yeah, we have a few minutes. So, um, yeah, in a couple of minutes, maybe we'll open up for questions, since I know you have a lot of uh, people here that I think we'll want to ask. Um, okay, I have one last question, though, since we've talked so much about India and your immersion in India. Um, I was wondering whether it's changed your relationship to your roots and Lithuania when you sort of go back. Definitely, yes, and I think it's not something unique to me. Many people discover their roots when they travel thousands of kilometers away because you assert yourself not, not only by what you see you know, around you in your native surrounding, but very often you realize what you are when you face something slightly different. And while we have some similarities and it's very always very interesting to, to, to discover, find those similarities through language, through religion, and, and, and many more. But the identity, and you know, even in science, it's called uh, this, as they call it, remote nationalism, I think. You know, many Indians have become very practicing Hindus or very Indian while living in the US, for example, because they suddenly missed on something that is taken for granted because in your own quarter, it's, everything is like, you know, it's, it's very much for granted. But when you miss it, when you lose it, you start reflecting on it. So definitely, yes, uh, what generally this relationship is, I used to joke, and I think it's in that book also, you know, the people would always say, you are, why are you fascinated or why are you in love with India? I jokingly replied, and it's recorded, I said, I'm not in love anymore, I'm married to India, <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> with that relationship comes much more than love, because in love you idealize, you, you know, uh, it's never very sober relationship. You imagine things into, into that object, but when you have a very daily um, relationship, like in marriage or like in a very constant uh, connection, then you see things how they are much more and then you have to also come to terms with things you don't like. I mean, there are things I don't like. Uh, obviously, there is this and that and it's about every country. You go and certain things are just not what you like. But, you know, you have to take it in totality. You accept that it is how it is, you know, and it's probably because of things that you have learned that you understand them. Thank you. I think we have uh, a few questions. Can I ask? Uh, good evening, Your Excellency. Uh, so I have a general question. Uh, what was uh, life like for you and Lithuanians in general during Soviet times? Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I recall it quite well. I graduated uh, my school in the last year of occupation and my, I joined university in the first year of independence. So I said, me as a young adult, as a student, uh, my life started together with the life of a new country, which is in fact an old country, you know, from 13th century, but it had lost its independence. It was colonized for some time. Life, what it was for a child, you know, um, for example, my parents would avoid me, you know, telling me the much of the truth that now we know about the exiles to Siberia, that part of our family died there, and we had to suffer, that everything has been taken from my grandparents, whatever land he had, were all taken. So that I didn't know. I, 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 they, they wanted to protect me. They preferred not to tell me. But then when things started surfacing about that, how much of it, you know, we lost. And I think the biggest thing was you had to think the way the party thought and told you, and you had no right of traveling or interacting with foreigners. Like the same Poshka, the traveler and scholar, when he came back to uh, Lithuania, Soviets came, took over, uh, then Nazis came, you know, then Soviets came back and stayed. Uh, he was sentenced to Siberia for, for basically 
having friends abroad, that was, uh, you know, a crime in itself. Because he had traveled this big journey, he knew languages, he had friends. So, you know, that was something. You were not supposed to be knowing any other languages. You had, I mean, no correspondences with abroad, maybe from a couple of socialist friendly countries. And traveling abroad was like travel to the moon. And I remember when I even in 91 or 2 studied, started studying Indian philosophy and uh, the lecturer was teaching us about Buddhism. He said, you know, there is this um, uh, sprout of a Bodhi tree that is in Sri Lanka, in Anuradhapura. So when you are in Sri Lanka, please visit. You know, it was a sort of a cruel joke. Even then we thought it was like going to Sri Lanka was like to the moon. It was impossible, uh, that cruel it was. You were closed up, you could not communicate, and you had to only think one way. If you could not agree, then, you know, psychiatric clinic, whatever, uh, banishment from any life uh, of a writer, of a publisher, was, was the other alternative. Many people actually suffered that. But it's a very long story, so difficult to give you a very brief answer. Thank you. Good evening, and uh, let me tell you, we are really captivated listening to you. Uh, we walked in a short while ago, and listening to you has been a pleasure. So I've got a couple of questions. Um, one is that, you know, pe people coming in from abroad find India to be multi-layered, complex. Uh, there are so many things to discover. Now, that is our civilization. So if you would like to compare that with Lithuania, how do you think, you know, what are the layers that you have there in your society, in your country, uh, when you compare with India? Because that will be something interesting to know. Uh, so, and second question, so in your book, um, what is it that we would discover if we were to read through your book? Uh, discover once, I mean, can you repeat the second question? Second question is, what is it that we would discover by going through what you have written? In the same book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the first question first and the second later. If you want. Well, on the first question, I think there are layers in every society because society is very dynamic thing, you know, it changes and people easily forget. I think our biggest tragedy as human beings is that we forget history and what has happened to us because it tends to repeat and then you stand lost once again without you know any slightest idea how to how to go about it now the layers in my society are uh, of course uh, you know you have to understand that it's a very small country so we are talking about uh, the country size of himachal pradesh uh, and even smaller in population uh, but uh, we have uh, we are the last christians sort of the last uh, pagans of europe uh, the country has been christianized the last absolutely last on the european map so we have a very strong layer of a pre-christian culture which we don't probably recollect but it's all there in your daily rituals like okay still uh, very recently people in villages used to feed snakes with milk or grass snakes, it's not a poisonous snake. So uh, after milking a cow, a lady would normally put, you know, give some milk, leave it for the grass snake to come and feed on it. Uh, trees, you know, the sanctity of trees that, you know, I was recently reading that in the 19th century, a Catholic priest had to cut a very old oak. An oak was a sacred tree for pre-Christian Lithuanians. So he was afraid, he was worried that you know, there would be consequences for her hurting the tree, so they had to perform special prayers, even in Christianity, to which indirectly says, sorry, I'll have to cut you. It's something you know, that is done in India a lot. So those layers, and you, know, you have Christian, then you have uh, modernity, then you have Soviet occupation, which unavoidably stamped us for some time. We still have some sort of a lay, you know, sometimes a complex of inferiority. Some of our treasures are still in Russian museums. I mean, it's very simple. I mean, it's very simple for me to understand Indians in many ways because colonizing is colonizing. It's the same. It's about stealing your, your intellectual, you know, value, and leaving you robbed of of that uh, strength. So, 
Yes, and what is it that I could discover in my book? I mean, I think I have to read it again because so many, so many years have passed. Um, uh, there would definitely be uh, details that might prompt me to take up what one other aspect of India and study it since I'm here and now I have another three years to, to do it. So I think it's endless and it's open-ended. It would never be a time where me or anyone else for that matter would say, yes, I have understood or I have known India. No, I don't think. I don't see it coming. <laughs>